Ad ogni buon conto adesso abbiamo l'ultima relazione che terrà il professor eh, Jean-François Bergman sulla eh, profilassi farmacologica e meccanica. Lo ringraziamo per averci raggiunto da Parigi qui in Italia e siamo attenti alla sua presentazione. Buongiorno. Scusi, non parlo italiano. Uh, I'm sorry about that, so I will uh, try to do my best in English with my French accent. I'm very pleased to be here. My grand-grandfather was Italian, so Bergman is back in Italy. Uh, so I will try to, to speak about uh, prophylaxy, medical and physical prophylaxy in medical patients, and uh, we'll try to include the discussion about new oral anticoagulation uh, in, in our strategy. This is my disclosure form. Um, what we are usually listening from us, from you, from me, from my colleague, is a list of complaints. I don't care about prophylaxis in medical patients. I don't know. I don't believe. It's not a problem. Uh, so it's too complicated. I don't know which drug uh, have to to give. So we will try to uh, speak about all these points, and I will give you some uh, proposition to improve the quality of the prevention of the vein thrombosis in our uh, medical patients. So fir first step, first uh, complaint is I don't care. It's not my problem. I, I, I don't have any patient with the vein thrombosis in medical world. So just go back to epidemiology uh, with such a high number of deaths related to venous thrombosis, half a million in Europe, much more than other diseases. And uh, the mortality of this disease is high. If you look at this uh, slide, you can see that uh, after two or three months after the deep vein thrombosis, the global mortality rate is around 15%. So it is a severe disease. We can't say, I don't care. And also, a lot of these uh, uh, deep vein thrombosis are not diagnosed. And uh, when uh, we do autopsic studies, we, we can find a, a, a very high number of deep vein thrombosis without any diagnosis before the death. The second complaint could be, I don't know. I don't know if the treatment is really useful to prevent the vein thrombosis in medical patients. In fact, we have at least three well-conducted uh, well study, double-blind, randomized study, with, uh, uh, sorry, back, one with enoxaparin, dalteparin, fondaparinux, all those studies show a great uh, decrease in the incidence of new deep vein thrombosis. So there is no doubt about the quality of the evidence of the quality of the trials. Okay, I know, but maybe I don't believe. So I can say, yes, we have three good conduct trials, but is it enough to believe in the prophylaxis? And then we go back to meta-analysis, like the dentally meta-analysis, and uh, he clearly shown that the efficacy is not only on DVT uh, with venographic diagnosis or echographic diagnosis. It is also efficacy on symptomatic DVT. It is also efficacy on pulmonary embolism. So it is only to, not only to prevent an echographic event, but also to prevent a clinically relevant event. And also, fatal PE uh, is, is, uh, is reduced uh, by the use of low molecular heparins in prevention of the vein thrombosis in medical uh, patients. So it was clear, then uh, Claudio came uh, with me, and uh, we, we made this uh, LifeNOC study uh, published last year, 
and I, I accept the fact that this, this study is now a bit confusing. So I would like to, to go back to this LifeNOX study uh, conducting in China and in India. Uh, it, it is a long story. Uh, we spend years and years to try to explain to the drug companies that it is not enough to do trials only with uh, uh, echographic endpoint or radiologic endpoint. What do we want to know is does the prophylaxis prevent clinically relevant event? And if you prevent deep vein thrombosis, you might prevent PE, pulmonary embolism. You might prevent fatal PE, and you might prevent mortality. So it was the same design, but a completely different goal. The endpoint was not to prevent deep vein thrombosis, but the endpoint was global mortality. And we made the hypothesis that we can decrease the global mortality after an hospitalization for an acute medical disease by a global absolute de de decrease by 2%. So it was a 8,000 8, patients study of patients with a, an acute medical illness, and it was a placebo control study, since in these countries the prophylaxis is not recommended, so it was acceptable to do a placebo control study, and all the patients had an elastic stocking uh, in the two groups. So the result, this is the population. Most of them had heart failure, but most of them had also infection, pulmonary infection, urinary infection, and only a few of those patients had cancer. The result is clear, unfortunately for uh, Sanofi. Uh, the result is clear. There is absolutely no difference between enoxaparin and placebo to decrease the mortality, the global mortality. You see exactly the same rate of mortality, around 6 to 8 percent at three months, 5 uh, percent at one month. So we can say that this treatment is able to decrease the incidence of DVT. The, the three studies uh, is, is clear about that, but is not strong enough to decrease global mortality in medical inpatients. But there is no increase of the risk of bleeding, or a small increase, but not significant. So we can say that we can give the prophylaxis to prevent the morbidity of the DVT, but not to reduce the global mortality of uh, uh, hospitalization in a medical world. Next step in our complaint is, okay, uh, but uh, in fact, in my, in my professional practice, I, I see only few patients uh, with a high risk of deep vein thrombosis. And then we go back to the Ondor study published by uh, Ander Cohen in the Lancet uh, three years ago. It was a 31, 32 different country cross-sectional epidemiologic study without Italy. I don't know why Italy was not involved in this uh, large uh, uh, study. But when we go in, in medical patients, you see that if we look at the ACCP recommendation for the risk of DVT, in all those countries, about half of our patients hospitalized in medical department are at risk for DVT, half of our patients. So we can't say that it is not a problem when half of our patient is concerned by the risk of DVT. And now, if we look at the decision to give a prophylaxis in this country, we see a huge difference from one country to another. The best are uh, Germany. You know Germany, they always do what they have to do, so they are the best. Uh, and some countries, for economic reasons, do not prophylax. But the mean, the mean level of prophylaxis in all these countries for patients at risk 
the, the mean level has to be 100 percent, but in, re in the real life, it's only 40 percent. So we don't do our job correctly since more than half of our patients at risk for DVT uh, do not receive any prophylaxis. Another reason to do not prophylax is the fact that it is really a mess. It's a bit complicated to find which patient has, which patient do not has to receive the prophylaxis. We have a lot of risk factor uh, listed in this slide. So sometimes it's a bit complicated to choose which patient need and which patient do not need to receive the prophylaxis. And also, we have the bleeding risk, and we have very uh, numerous factors to increase the risk. So if you mix the thrombotic risk and the bleeding risk, sometimes it seems to be too complicated to choose which patient has to be treated or prevent. Another question is how to do the prevention. Do I have to use unfractionate heparin, low molecular weight heparin, new oral anticoagulant, we, we spoke about this uh, five minutes ago, or uh, a compressive elastic stocking. Of course, we will not speak about uh, vitamin K antagonist because it is uh, uh, only drug for long-term treatment and the prophylaxis in medical department is a short-term treatment, so there is no reason to use uh, vitamin K antagonist and also no reason to to use aspirin in medical patients because in the prevention of, of venous thrombosis, aspirin has no effect in medical patients. So what can we use? First, it is clear that in terms of clinical benefit and efficacy, it is better to use low molecule weight heparin or fundaparinux versus unfractionate heparin. And that's also the case in stroke patients, there is a superiority to use low molecular weight heparin. Could we use a new oral anticoagulant? Claudio showed us that it is a good drug with good efficacy in the uh, treatment of, uh, curative treatment of venous thrombosis. It is also a good treatment in atrial fibrillation. It's a good treatment in the prevention of orthopedic knee and, and uh, hip surgery. So why not in, in medical patients, why not using uh, this new oral anticoagulant? We have two studies to try to answer to that. The first study is Magellan study with uh, Rivaroxaban versus, uh, I will show you the design. It is a study in medical internal medicine patients uh, 8,000 patients, Riveroxaban 35 days versus Enoxaparin 40 milligram 10 days. This is, not, this is not a very fair design because you compare a new treatment for one month versus the comparator for only two days, 10 days. So it was not very fair to do such a, a design, but we will see the, the result. The result was uh, echographic deep vein, deep vein thrombosis at day 10 and day 35. And the, re the results are, are clear, at least at day 10, you have exactly the same efficacy in the prevention of deep vein thrombosis when you use en enoxaparin or when you use rivaroxaban. But when you look at the bleeding, there is a clear difference in favor of enoxaparin. So in opposition with the study in, in curative treatment, Claudio saw us where there is a same or a better efficacy without an increase of the bleeding risk. In this study, we have the same efficacy, but a clear increase of the bleeding risk. And now the second study uh, adopt, same design with apixaban versus enoxaparin, same design, uh, a smaller size calculation, but same design, and same result. In efficacy, at least at day 10, it is the same efficacy. Of course, at day 40, it is different, because remember that the enoxaparin stopped at day 10. So this, this arm was only with placebo, and this arm continued the treatment. So 
but at least during the hospitalization, the same efficacy, but in terms of uh, bleeding, an inferiority with a higher risk of bleeding with apixaban versus enoxaparin. So it could be very confusing to have those results. In fact, we have to think about what Claudio tell us about the, 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 the limits of this new oral anticoagulant. And why could we have good results in orthopedic surgery, in atrial fibrillation, in curative treatment of venous thrombosis, and bad result in prophylaxis in medical patients? So the reason for that, I think, is the fact that our patients with, a, with an acute medical illness are very unstable patients. They have fever, dehydration, inflammation, multi-pathology, multi-treatment, drug-drug interaction, and they have all the bad situation in the same time leading to a big variability in the metabolism of the new oral anticoagulant, which lead to a high bleeding risk. So it is easy to give this new oral anticoagulant in a stable patient who has to have orthopedic surgery or a stable patient with atrial fibrillation because he is in good health, he has a stable treatment. But when you speak to internal medicine acute illness, the patient is in an unstable situation and at this time it is really a risk to give them a drug with such a, a, a complicated and a, a difficult change in the metabolism because you have the bleeding risk. Do we have to use mechanical uh, prophylaxis? Uh, a lot of data, as we saw before, for the, pre for the prevention of post-thrombosis syndrome, a lot of data in surgery, but no data in medical patients, or at least two, two, uh, two studies, uh, recent studies. The first one was uh, a, comp a comparison between stocking and no stocking uh, control stocking in medical patient with stroke and there is no efficacy for the prevention of uh, deep vein thrombosis with stocking in patients in medical patient with stroke no efficacy and the second study was a comparison with uh, tight land versus below knee stocking so up stocking versus down stocking and in this study the result was in favor of uh, high tight land stocking, which is a bit confusing. So giving a, a, a tight stand stocking is as placebo, but giving a below knee stocking is worse than placebo, so don't do sto any stocking in medical patients. Next complaint, nobody helps me. I'm alone in front of my patient. I don't know what to do. In fact, we have, we spoke about that before, several recommendations. The ACCP 2012 recommendation is very clear about the, the recommendation for medical, medically ill patients. And we have some good recommendation for this patient. We know which one has to be treated and we know which kind of drug we have to give. And we have also the need for education, the need for uh, effort at each level to try to explain to the physician how to do and how to in improve their practice. So the, the, the RAM, the risk assessment models, are tools uh, to help us to choose which patients are at risk of deep vein thrombosis in medical department and which patients have to be treated. So you have the American risk assessment model. You have the British risk assessment model, a bit complicated, you need time to use it. You have the German uh, risk assessment model. You have the French risk assessment model, probably the simpler. Uh, old patient prophylaxis for everybody. Young patient, no prophylaxis. And between 40 and 50, think which is not the most easy thing to do. Uh, and to help us, 
we have a lot of, progr of program of education, uh, the DVT safety zone, for example, to give some information to help the physician to give the good prophylaxis. And in the US now, they have some DVT free zone. They consider DVT appearing in the hospital as a nosocomial in disease, like having an infection in the hospital. To have an infection in the hospital, a nosocomial infection, is the same as having a DVT in the hospital, is this a nosocomial disease. So they have a, a kind of a contract between the patient and the hospital. You have to do the best to prevent me against the DVT risk. And now it is the patient, we have a checklist to ask to the physician, do you do your best to prevent my DVT when I come in your hospital? With this, a, lo a lot of, of, ch of chart and information and, and flyer, something like that. And also, uh, for example, in Boston, they had a, an electronic alert on the, on the patient's chart. The, the, the doctor has to enter the, the clinical data on the patient. And then you have a flash on your screen saying, this patient is at risk of DVT. And when you use this kind of uh, alert, electronic alert, and when you use it to help the physician to know that the patient is at risk, you can uh, uh, decrease the number of, uh, of DVT. This is a patient free from DVT. So the number of patients free from DVT I is higher I if you use this intervention with electronic alert. Also, this is a, a, a program of education we, we use in France to teach the, 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 the young fellow and intern. And when, when we give them a, a specific a formation course and, and talk about prevention, the number of uh, patients in accordance with the recommendation is higher than if you have no education. The last point is the access to drug, and it's clear that uh, this is not uh, uh, a real uh, scientific problem, but it is an economic problem, and you can see that Bangladesh, Thailand, but also uh, Russia or Romania are the countries with the lower incidence of e efficient efficacy, and this is probably more uh, an economic problem than a medical problem. And we had some law in France to try to decrease the number of patients with deep vein thrombosis. The, the goal was to, a decrease of 15%. The, the British had uh, a recommendation from the House of Commons, and uh, the American had this uh, coalition to prevent deep vein thrombosis with uh, uh, Melanie Bloom. Melanie Bloom is the was the wife of Dave Bloom, and it was a very well-known journalist uh, at the CNN channel, and he, w he was covering the Iraq war. And in the plane back from Iraq to US, he died from, PI, from, from pulmonary embolism. And at this time, Melanie Bloom started to be the, the leader of this coalition to prevent DVT, and she is very efficient to, to work with the politician to try to, to put this DVT-free zone in all the American hospitals. So uh, we have to do all that to, to convince uh, all the, all the, the partners of the, of the patient care to, to be conscious about the, the, the problem of the DVT-PE in medical patients. So now if I go back to my first slide uh, and all my complaints I show you at the beginning, I will try you to summarize my, my proposition. You can't say I don't care because we have a lot of epidemiologic data to provide us information about the severity and the, the, the frequency of the disease. We can't say I don't know because we know that the prophylaxis is uh, with a good efficacy. Uh, we can't believe because we have meta-analysis, we have life nox to, to show that we prevent morbidity but not mortality. It is a problem for everybody, Italy, France, and all the, the other countries, 
with these 40 to 50 percent of patients with a risk and only 40 percent of the patient at risk receiving a prophylaxy. Uh, we know which drug we have to choose. We don't have to use aspirin. We don't have to use new oral anticoagulant. We don't have to use uh, anti vitamin K antagonist. So the only right choose, choice is low molecular heparin or fundaparinux, or in patients with renal failure, unfractionate heparin. It is not so complicated. We have all those risk assessment models. We have all this information. We have all this recommendation to help us. And we have also some tool to keep that in mind, us, our fellows, uh, the younger doctor, and we can uh, he help them to, to do the right choice. We have no time, or, or, of course, we never have enough time to do correctly our, our job, but we have to take time because it's a very important uh, disease and we have no money. This is the problem uh, of the politician. So uh, I think these drugs, this prophylaxy, uh, are efficient to prevent morbidity of venous thrombosis in the medical patient hospitalized for an acute medical disease, not for mortality, but for morbidity. Yes, we can do it. Thank you. Thank you.